Tort is an old French word derived from a, a Latin word, tortis, which means twisted or crooked, or turkire, which means to twist. In the Philippines, our concept of tort leans towards its civil law equivalent of culpa aquiliana. Enshrined under Article 2176, it is under the clause whoever by act or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence is obliged to pay for the damage done. Such fault or negligence, if there is no pre-existing contractual relations between parties, is called quasi-delict. A tortoise liability is one that arises from a breach of a duty primarily fixed by law. Such duty is towards persons generally, and its breaches redressable by an action for unliquidated damages. The different types of torts include 1. Certain intentional and malicious acts as provided under the report of the Code Commission. 2. Acts falling under quasi delics under Article 2176 of the New Civil Code, which is also called the negligence liability. 3. Strict liability torts wherein a person whose actions cause harm to another and is held responsible for that harm simply because he acted. Fourth, special torts, those defined under Articles 309, 21, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 32, 34, and 35. And fifth, kindred torts, those pertaining to medical practice. Strict liability towards originating in the 19th century, a person whose actions caused harm to another was in most situation held responsible for that harm simply because he acted. Under the doctrine of strict liability, it is unnecessary to prove the defendant's negligence. Can a plaintiff recover damages twice for the same omission of the defendant? Why? The answer is no. In the case of Supreme Transportation, Liner versus Felix Roos, with juror number 20444, and Safeguard Security Agency versus Tang Ko, with juror number 165732, in both cases, the Supreme Court reiterated that an act or omission causing damage to another may give rise to separate civil liabilities on the part of the offender. That is, one civil liability ex delicto under Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code, and two independent civil liabilities such as those a. not arising from an act or omission complained of as a felony, example, culpa contractual or obligations arising from law, under Article 31 of the Civil Code, intentional torts under Article 32 and 34, and culpa, Achilliana, under Article 2176 of the Civil Code, or B, where the injured party is granted a right to file an action independent and distinct from the criminal action, under Article 33 of the Civil Code. Either of these liabilities may be enforced against the offender subject to the caveat or limitations under Article 2177 of the Civil Code, that the offended party cannot recover damages twice for the same act or omission or under both causes. Therefore, the petitioners as the injured parties have to choose the remedy by which to enforce their claim in the event of favorable decisions in both actions. The prescription against double recovery is found under Article 2177 of the New Civil Code that, again, provides that the responsibility for fault or negligence based on quasi delic is entirely separate and distinct from the civil liability arising from negligence under the Penal Code. But the plaintiff, as heavily reiterated in the cases mentioned above, cannot recover damages twice for the same act or omission of the defendant. Will an acquittal from an accusation of criminal negligence be a bar to a subsequent civil action? In the case of Nemencio, Azucena v. Severino Potenciano in Laguna Transportation, 
The Supreme Court said that civil action for recovery of damages based on quasi-delic, acquittal in criminal action, is not a bar to civil action. A civil action to recover damages on the tier of quasi-delic may proceed, although the defendant therein was acquitted in the criminal case because, according to Articles 33 and 2177 of the Civil Code, the civil action is entirely independent of the criminal case. To subordinate the civil action contemplated in said articles to the result of the criminal prosecution would render meaningless the independent character of the civil action and the clear injunction of Article 31 that such action may proceed independently of the criminal proceedings and regardless of the result of the latter. Yet, in a more recent case, Gaia v. Sendio, the court explained that the acquittal of the accused does not automatically preclude a judgment against him on the civil aspect of the case. The extinction of the penal action does not carry with it the extinction of the civil liability, where a. the acquittal is based on reasonable doubt as only preponderance of evidence is required, b. The court declares that the liability of the accused is only civil, and c. The civil liability of the accused does not arise from or is not based upon the crime of which the accused is acquitted. However, the civil action based on delic may be deemed extinguished if mere is a finding on the final judgment in the criminal action that the act or omission from which the civil liability may arise did not exist, or where the accused did not commit the acts or omission imputed to him. May the civil action for Copa Aquiliana and the criminal action for the same negligent act be filed simultaneously? Yes. And the perfect example is the case of Supreme Transportation Liner versus San Andres GR 20444, which was decided in August 15, 2018, penned by Chief Justice Lucas Bersamin. The Supreme Court discussed that the omission of the driver in violation of Article 365 of the Revised Penal Code could give rise not only to the obligation ex delicto, but also to the obligation based on culpa aquiliana under Article 2176 of the Civil Code. Under the factual antecedents given, both obligations rested on the common element of negligence. Article 2177 of the Civil Code in Section 3 Rule 111 of the Rules of Court allow the injured party to prosecute both criminal and civil actions simultaneously, as also clarified in Kasupaan v. La Roya. Nonetheless, the prescription against double recovery has to be observed. Under the principle of res ipsa locutor, the plaintiff must prove that, first, the thing or instrumentality which caused the injury complained of was under the control or management of the defendant. Second, that the occurrence resulting in the injury was such as in the ordinary course of things would not happen if those who had its control or management used proper care. Third, there is a sufficient evidence or, as sometimes stated, reasonable evidence. And last, in the absence of explanation by the defendant that the injury arose from or was caused by the defendant's want of care. The doctrine of res ipsa locator, which means speaks for itself as a rule of evidence is peculiar to the law of negligence, which recognizes that prima facie negligence may be established without direct proof and furnishes a substitute for the specific proof of negligence. The doctrine is not a rule of substantive law, but merely a mode of proof or a procedural convenience. Thus, an innocent defendant need to show or explain that the doctrine can be invoked when and only when, under the circumstances involved, direct evidence is absent and not readily available. Therefore, it has generally been held that 
the presumption of inference arising from the doctrine cannot be availed of or is overcome where plaintiff has knowledge and justifies or presents evidence as to the specific act of negligence. 3. When a bank regularly sends a statement of account to the client, will the bank be liable for discrepancies in the future when the client will complain after sufficient lapse of time? Yes, the bank will still be liable for discrepancies in the future. The Supreme Court held that banks are required to exercise highest degree of diligence. Here, discrepancies in the client's statement of account is a proof that the bank did not exercise the required degree of diligence tantamount to negligence on the part of the bank. What is the principle of implied invitation to visit the premises of another? This is better appreciated in the case of David Taylor versus the Manila Electric Railroad and Light Company. The plaintiff, David Taylor, was at the time when he received the injuries complained of, 15 years of age, the son of mechanical engineer, more mature than the average boy of his age and having considerable aptitude and training in mechanics. On the 30th of September 1905, plaintiff with a boy named Manuel Claporos, about 12 years of age, crossed the footbridge of the Isla Provisor for the purpose of visiting one Murphy, an employee of the defendant, who, and promised to make them a cylinder for a miniature engine. Finding on inquiry that Mr. Murphy was not in his quarters, the boys, impelled apparently by youthful curiosity and perhaps by the unusual interest which both seemed to have taken in machinery, spent some time in wandering about the company's premises. The visit was made on a Sunday afternoon, and it does not appear that they saw or spoke to anyone after leaving the powerhouse where they had asked for Mr. Murphy. After watching the operation of the traveling crane used in handling the defendant's call, they walked across the open space in the neighborhood of the place where the company dumped in the cinders and ashes from its furnaces. Here, they found some 20 or 30 brass fulminating caps scattered on the ground. These caps are approximately the size and appearance of small pistol cartridges, and each has attached to it two long thin wires by means of which it may be discharged by the use of electricity. They are intended for use in the explosion of blasting charges of dynamite and having themselves a considerable explosive power. After some discussion as to the ownership of the caps and their right to take them, the boys picked up all they could find and carried them home and made series of experiments with the caps. When they applied lighted match to the contents, an explosion followed, causing more or less serious injuries to Manuel had his hand burned and wounded, and David was struck in the face by several particles of the metal capsule one of which endured his right eye to such an extent as to the necessitate its removal by the surgeons who were called in to care for his wounds. From the evidence, no measures seem to have been adopted by the defendant company to prohibit or prevent visitors from entering and walking about its premises unattended. When they felt this post so to do, the Supreme Court said through Justice Cooley that children, wherever they go, must be expected to act upon childlike instincts and impulses, and others who are chargeable with a duty of care and caution toward them must calculate upon this and take precautions accordingly. If they live exposed to the observation of children anything which would be tempting to them, and which they in their immature judgment might naturally suppose they were at liberty to handle or play with, they should expect that liberty to be taken. At the same eminent jurist in his treatise or torts, alluding to the doctrine of implied invitation to visit the premises of another, he says, In the case of young children and other persons not fully, sui juris, an implied license might sometimes arise when it would not on behalf of others, thus leaving a tempting thing for children to play with exposed, where they would be likely to gather for that purpose, may be equivalent to an invitation for them 
to make use of it, and perhaps, if one were to throw away upon his premises, near the common way, things tempting to children, the same implication should arise. Number five, what is the doctrine of attractive nuisance? The doctrine of attractive nuisance states that one who maintains on his premises dangerous instrumentalities or appliances of a character likely to attract children in play, and who fails to exercise ordinary care to prevent children from playing therewith or resorting thereto, is liable to a child of tender years who is injured thereby, even if the child is technically a trespasser in the premises. American jurisprudence shows that the attractive nuisance doctrine generally is not applicable to bodies of water, artificial as well as natural, in the absence of some unusual condition or artificial feature other than the mere water and its location. And this was explained in the case of Hidalgo Enterprises versus Balandan. 6. What is the doctrine of the last clear chance? The doctrine of last clear chance provides that where both parties are negligent, but the negligent act of one is appreciably later in point of time than that of the other, or where it is impossible to determine whose fault or negligence brought about the occurrence of the incident. The one who had the last opportunity to avoid the impending harm, but failed to do so, is chargeable with the consequences arising therefrom. Stated differently, the rule is that the antecedent negligence of a person does not preclude recovery of damages caused by the supervening negligence of the latter, who had the last fair chance to prevent the impending harm by the exercise of due diligence. Now, is this applicable in case of culpa contractual? In the case of Consolidated Bank and Trust Company known as Solid Bank versus CA and DS, the Supreme Court said that the doctrine of last clear chance is not applicable because Solid Bank is liable for breach of contract due to negligence in the performance of its contractual obligation to LCDS. This is a case of culpa contractual where neither the contributory negligence of the plaintiff nor his last clear chance to avoid the loss would exonerate the defendant from liability. Such contributory negligence or last clear chance by the plaintiff merely serves to reduce the recovery of damages by the plaintiff but does not exculpate the defendant from his breach of contract. 7. What is the emergency rule? Emergency rule is one of the defenses allowed in quasi-offenses. One who suddenly finds himself in a place of danger and is required to act without time to consider the best means that may be adopted to avoid the impending danger, is not guilty of negligence if he fails to adopt what subsequently, and upon reflection may appear to have been, a better method, unless the emergency in which he finds himself is brought about by his own negligence. And so is this applicable when the danger one finds himself was caused by his own negligence? In Marikina Autoline Transport Corporation v. Freddy Suelto, the Supreme Court related emergency rule to Article 2185 of the New Civil Code that provides, unless there is proof to the contrary, it is presumed that the person driving a motor vehicle has been negligent if at the time of a mishap he was violating any traffic regulation. It further concluded that the severe damages sustained could not have resulted had the accused acted as a reasonable and prudent man could. The accused was not diligent as he claims to be. What is more probable is that the accused had to swerve to the right and hit the commercial apartment of the plaintiff because he could not make a full stop as he was driving too fast in a usually crowded street. 1. What is good faith? Good faith is defined by the Supreme Court in the case of Ochoa, with GR number 146259. Good faith is an intangible and abstract quality with no technical meaning or statutory definition, and it encompasses, among other things, an honest belief, the absence of malice and the absence of design to defraud or to seek an unconscionable advantage. It implies honesty of intention and freedom from knowledge of circumstances 
which ought to put the holder upon inquiry. The essence of good faith lies in an honest belief in the validity of one's right. Ignorance of a superior claim and absence of intention to overreach another. Applied to possession, one is considered in good faith if he is not aware that there exists in his title or mode of acquisition any flaw which invalidates it. What rule was expressed with the principle of cardinal law on human conduct as cited in C. Commercial v. C.A.? In this case, the cardinal law on human conduct is expressed in Article 19 of the Civil Code, and it has given rise to certain rules, that is, that where a person exercises his rights, but does so arbitrarily or unjustly, or performs his duties in a manner that is not in keeping with honesty and good faith, he opens himself to liability. The elements of an abuse of rights under Article 19 are, 1. There is a legal right or duty. 2. Which is exercised in bad faith. 3. For the sole intent of prejudicing or injuring another. It further explained that Article 19 was intended to expand the concept of torts by granting adequate legal remedy for the untold number of moral wrongs, which is impossible for human foresight to provide specifically in statutory law. If mere fault or negligence in one's acts can make him liable for damages for injury caused thereby, with more reason should abuse or bad faith make him liable. The absence of good faith is essential to abuse of right. Good faith is an honest intention to abstain from taking any unconscientious advantage of another. Even through the forms or technicalities of the law, together with an absence of all information or belief of fact which would render the transaction unconscientious. In business relations, it means good faith as understood by men of affairs. That is number two. Three, what is emotional distress? It is defined under the case of MVRS publications versus Islamic Tawa. Emotional distress means any highly unpleasant mental reaction, such as extreme grief, shame, humiliation, embarrassment, anger, disappointment, worry, nausea, mental suffering and anguish, shock, fright, horror, and chagrin, or severe emotional distress in some jurisdictions refer to any type of severe and disabling emotional or mental condition which may be generally recognized and diagnosed by professionals trained to do so, including post-traumatic stress disorder, neurosis, psychosis, chronic depression, or phobia. And in order to recover for the intentional infliction of emotional distress, the plaintiff is required to show, among other things, that he or she has suffered emotional distress so severe that no reasonable person could be expected to endure it. Severity of the distress is an element of the cause of action, not simply a matter of damages. Furthermore, any party seeking recovery for mental anguish must prove more than mere worry, anxiety, vexation, embarrassment, or anger. Liability does not arise from mere insults, indignities, threats, annoyances, pity expressions, or other trivialities. In determining whether the tort of outrage had been committed, a plaintiff is necessarily expected and required to be hardened to a certain amount of criticism, rough language, and to occasional attacks and words that are definitely inconsiderate and unkind. The mere fact that the actor knows that the other will regard the conduct as insulting or will have his feelings hurt is not enough. It must be stressed that words which are merely insulting are not actionable as libel or slander per se, and mere words of general abuse, however, opprobrious, ill-natured, or vexatious, whether written or spoken, do not constitute a basis for an action for defamation in the absence of allegation for special damages. 
the fact that the language is offensive to the plaintiff does not make it actionable by itself. Therefore, to recover for the intentional infliction of emotional distress under the second restatement of the law, the plaintiff must show that a. the conduct of the defendant was intentional or in reckless disregard of the plaintiff, b. the conduct was extreme and outrageous, c. there was a causal connection between the defendant's conduct and the plaintiff's mental distress, and d. the plaintiff's mental distress was extreme and severe. What is extreme and outrageous conduct as a cause of action? It means that the conduct is so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in civilized society. The defendant's actions must have been so terrifying as naturally to humiliate, embarrass, or frighten the plaintiff. Generally, conduct will be found to be actionable where the recitation of the facts to an average member of the community would arouse his resentment against the actor and lead him or her to exclaim outrageous as his or her reaction. What does the law protect against violation of human dignity when it punishes the acts enumerated on the same provision? Article 26 of the Civil Code provides punishment as actionable towards of several acts by a person of meddling and prying into the privacy of another. As it provides, every person shall respect the dignity, personality, privacy, and peace of mind of his neighbors and other persons. The following and similar acts, though, may not constitute a criminal offense, shall produce a cause of action, damages, prevention, and other relief. What are the elements of tortuous interference with contractual relations? The answer is enumerated in the case of So Ping Ban versus Court of Appeals, Tequa Enterprises, and Manuel C. Tiong. As follows. The elements of tort interference are 1. Existence of a valid contract. 2. Knowledge of the part of the third person of the existence of the contract. And 3. Interference of the third person is without legal justification or excuse. A duty which the law of torts is concerned with is respect for the property of others and a cause of action ex delicto may be predicated upon an unlawful interference by one person of the enjoyment of the other of his private property. This may pertain to a situation where a third person induces a party to renege on or violate his undertaking under a contract. And eight, what is the rationale behind the duty of the courts to the underdog under Article 24 of the Civil Code. Article 24 reads, In all contractual property or other relations, when one of the parties is at a disadvantage on account of his moral dependence, ignorance, indigence, mental weaknesses, tender age, or other handicap, the courts must be vigilant for his protection. And the rationale behind this duty is because the law takes great interest in the welfare of the weak and the handicapped. Thus, we have parents pay tree. Literally, parents pay tree means father or parent of his country. In the U.S., as in the Philippines, the phrase refers to the sovereign power of the state in safeguarding the rights of the person under disability, such as the insane and the incompetent. Thus, were the law always to be applied strictly, there would be danger that injustice might arise. The state as parents patria is under the obligation to minimize the risk of those who, because of their minority, are as yet unable to take care of themselves fully. Therefore, in case of doubt, the doubt must be resolved in favor of the underdog. Like in labor contracts, doubts are resolved in favor of the decent living and safety of the worker. How do you prove damages? Under Article 2199, there must be pleading and proof of actual damages suffered for the same to be recovered. In addition to the fact that the amount of loss must be capable of proof, it must also be actually proven with a reasonable degree of certainty, premise of incompetent proof, or the best evidence obtainable. 
The burden of proof of the damage suffered is consequently imposed on the party claiming the same. Corollary to the principle that a claim for actual damages cannot be predicated on flimsy, remote, speculative, and substantial proof. Courts are likewise required to state the factual basis of the award for the same to be recovered. 2. Why is it that no proof is necessary in case of moral, nominal, temperate, or exemplary? No proof of pecuniary loss is necessary to recover moral, nominal, temperate, or exemplary damages, but factual basis must be shown. The assessment of such damages is left to the discretion of the court according to the circumstances of each case. Further, it is essential that the claimant should satisfactorily prove the existence of the factual basis of the damages and its causal relation to defendant's acts. In other words, it must be proven that the act or omission of the defendant is wrongful or that he acted with fraud or in bad faith. This is so because such damages, though incapable of pecuniary estimation, are in the category of an award designed to compensate the claimant for actual injury suffered and not to impose penalty on the wrongdoer. The assessment of nominal damages is left to the discretion of the court according to the circumstances of the case. They are not intended indemnification of loss suffered but for the vindication of a right violated or invaded. 3. What must it concur so that there is basis for award? In actual damages, in order to be recovered, it must be supported by proof or documents that would help the court to calculate the amount of damages to be recovered. On the other hand, other damages will need to satisfactorily prove the existence of the factual basis of the damages and its causal relation to the defendant's act. The underlying basis for the award of torts and damages is the premise that an individual was injured in contemplation of law. Thus, there must be first breach of some duty and the imposition of liability for that breach before damages may be awarded. It is not sufficient to state that there should be tort liability merely because the plaintiff suffered some pain and suffering. Fourth, what happens when a damage results from a person's exercise of his legal right? To warrant the recovery of damages, there must be both a right of action for a legal wrong inflicted by the defendant and damage resulting to the plaintiffs therefrom. Wrong without damage or damage without wrong does not constitute a cause of action, since damages are merely part of the remedy allowed for the injury caused by a breach of wrong. Thus, there must be the presence of legal injury, that if the injury is a result of another person's exercise of his legal right, then no damages is recoverable. Damages in tort are generally awarded to restore the plaintiff to the position he or she was in, had the tort not occurred. They are intended to put an injured party in the position that in which he was before he was injured, not to ensure completely that the plaintiffs will be placed to the rest of his life in the same position as if he had not sustained the injuries. But it is a compensation once and for all, and must be adequate and commensurable with the injuries and the consequences of them to plaintiff. It can only be at best a very rough estimate of plaintiff's entitlement. 6. What are general and special damages? General damages are those necessarily resulting from the wrongful act or omission asserted as the foundation of the liability and include those which follows as a conclusion of law from the statement of the facts of injury. In other words, general damages are those which are traceable to and the probable and necessary result of the injury or which are presumed by or implied in law to have resulted therefrom. The general statement that general damages are those necessarily resulting from the wrong does not mean that they must, a priori, inevitably, and always result therefrom. It is not enough if, in the particular instance, they are in fact result from the wrong directly and proximately and without reference 
to the special character, conditions, or circumstances of the person wronged. The law then, as a matter of course, implies or presumes them as the effect which necessarily result from wrong. Special damages, on the other hand, denotes such damages as arise from special circumstances of the case, which, if properly pleaded, may be added to the general damages of the case, which the law presumes or implies from the mere invasion of the plaintiff's right. Special damages are the natural but not the necessary result of an injury. In other words, special damages actually but not necessarily result from the injury, and these are not implied by law. An example would be loss of earnings, medical expenses, and repair bills that may be the direct result of a car accident. In addition to being injured and incurring medical bills for treatment, a person may also have to be off work while he recovers and pay for repairs to his vehicle. What is the significance? The distinction between general and special damages are principally important with regard to the pleadings in damage actions. General damages, which necessarily result from the injury complained of, may be recovered under a general allegation of damage whereas special damages must be specifically pleaded. Summarize the principles or requirements for the grant of actual damages. Under the Civil Code, when an injury has been sustained, actual damages may be awarded under the following condition. Article 2199, except as provided by law or by stipulation, one is entitled to an adequate compensation only for such pecuniary loss suffered by him as he has duly proved. Such compensation is referred to as actual or compensatory damages. And as stated in Di Hua Liang Electrical Equipment Company versus Reyes, actual or compensatory damages cannot be presumed but must be duly proved and proved with a reasonable degree of certainty. A court cannot rely on speculation, conjecture, or guesswork as to the fact and amount of damages but must depend upon competent proof that they have suffered and on evidence of the actual amount thereof. If the proof is flimsy and unsubstantial, no damages will be awarded. Jurisprudence has consistently held that, to justify an award of actual damages, credence can be given only to claims which are duly supported by receipts. This is lifted from the case of Seven Brothers Shipping Corporation versus DMC Construction Resources, GR 193914, 2014. What is preponderance of evidence? This is explained in the case of Republic of the Philippines versus Alfredo de Borja. It says, in civil cases, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to establish his case by preponderance of evidence, that is, superior weight of evidence on the issues involved. Preponderance of evidence means evidence which is of greater weight or more convincing than that which is offered in opposition to it. What is pecuniary loss? Pecuniary loss is a loss that can be measured in numbers, meaning the court can tally up receipts to calculate the compensation the claimant deserves. The most common pecuniary losses, otherwise known as financial losses, are lost wages future lost wages, medical bills, or any cost associated with damages that occurred during the incident. Finally, what are the components of actual damages? The following are the components of actual damages. 1. Loss of income, medical expenses, property repairs, business losses, and 5th, legal fees. What is the doctrine of vicarious liability? Vicarious liability is a legal doctrine in tort law that imposes responsibility upon one person for the failure of another or assigns liability for an injury to a person who did not cause the injury, but with whom the person has a special legal relationship to exercise such care as a reasonably prudent person would use under similar circumstances. It is also referred to as imputed negligence. Legal relationships that can lead to imputed negligence include the relationship between parent and child, husband and wife, 
owner of a vehicle and driver, an employer and employee, and the likes. Ordinarily, the independent negligence of one person is not imputable to another person. The legal basis of vicarious liability is Article 2180 of the Civil Code that enumerates those who are subject to this vicarious liability. Among them are teachers and heads of establishment of arts and trades with respect to their pupils and students and apprentices so long as they remain in their custody. In order that one may not be made to satisfy this liability, one needs to prove that the diligence of a good father of a family was observed to prevent damage. The Supreme Court refined the definition of custody as used in Article 2180. In Amadora v. C. A., it was held not to mean the student must be boarding with the school authorities, but it does signify that the student should be within the control and under the influence of the school authorities at the time of the occurrence of the injury. Whether the semester or school term has not yet begun or has already ended, as long as the student is still subject to the disciplinary authority of the school and cannot consider himself released altogether from observance of its rules, he is in the custody of the school. Also, as long as the student is in the school premises in pursuance of a legitimate student objective in the exercise of a legitimate student right and even in the enjoyment of a legitimate student privilege, like doing nothing but relaxing in the campus in the company of his classmates, the responsibility of the school authorities over the student continues. School heads and teachers are subject to this vicarious liability because they stand to a certain extent as to their pupils or students in local parentis or as substitute parents as expressly provided under Article 218 of the Family Code. Schools exercise their educational functional principally through their administrators and teachers, while parents exercise their parental authority by sending their children to school to comply with their duty to educate them according to their means, as provided in Article 220 of the Family Code and Article 72 of the Child and Youth Welfare Code as amended. Consequently, when parents send their minor child to school, they must necessarily pass on or share their parental authority, their custody over the child, and the responsibility to educate their child properly with the school, its administrators and teachers temporarily, as the latter shall assume such during all the time the child is under their supervision and instruction. This, in essence, is the principle of substituted parental authority. A teacher's liability arises from the failure to provide due diligence in the performance of the responsibilities that come with the substituted parental authority. A teacher must not only be charged with teaching but also vigilance over their students or pupils. Without the parents to look after their children when in school, it is the teacher who takes over in the supervision. It is thus fitting that the basis of a teacher's liability is the principal of in loco parentis, which according to Black Law's dictionary, it means in place of a parent. The law holds them liable unless they relieve themselves of such liability pursuant to the last paragraph of Article 2180 by proving that they observe all the diligence to prevent damage. The same law applies to all kinds of educational institutions, academic or vocational, when an academic institution accepts students for enrollment, there is established a contract between them, resulting in bilateral obligations, which both parties are bound to comply with. The contract between school and student is one imbued with public interest, but a contract nonetheless. In Police Oak Doctrine, the spouse's police oak versus brilliantes et al. Raised into a doctrine the idea that teachers are responsible for the acts of their students, not only minors but those emancipated as well. Dominator Poliso, deceased son of petitioner spouse's Poliso, and the defendant Virgilio de Fon, who was not a minor, were classmates at the Manila Technical Institute. There was a fight during recess time, and de Fon caused the death of Dominador Poliso. The child court found the phone responsible for Dominador's death and sentenced 
him to pay damages. However, the owner, Antonio Brillantes, and the president, Teodosio Valenton of Manila Technical Institute, and the teacher in charge of the students at the time, Santiago Kibulu, were absolved. The spouses appealed. In this particular case, the action was instituted directly against the school officials, and the Supreme Court had the occasion to decide directly on the question of the liability of teachers and heads of school under Article 2180 of the Civil Code for damages caused by their pupils and students against fellow students on the school premises. The Supreme Court held that defendants Valenton, president of M MTI, and Kibuli, or Bulu, teacher in charge, were liable. According to the High Tribunal, the death resulting from the fight of the students could have been avoided if Valenton and Kibulu had complied with their duty of providing adequate supervision over the activities of the students in the school premises to protect their students from harm, whether at the hands of fellow students or other parties. The construction of the phrase, so long as the students remain in their custody, previously it was understood to mean that the student actually boarded in the school. Now it was understood to mean the protective and supervisory custody that the school and its heads and teachers exercise over the pupils and students for as long as they are at the attendance in the school, including recess time. In other words, it is not necessary that the student actually boarded in the school as long as they are at attendance in school. The school authorities will be liable. The school head and the teacher in charge will found liable even if the phone was already of age at the time of the commission of the offense. There was intent that the liability be not restricted to the case of persons under age. Furthermore, teachers and heads of scholarly establishments are not grouped with parents and guardians but ranged with owners and managers of enterprises, employers in the state as to whom no reason is discernible to imply that they should answer only for minors. The responsibility of the teachers and the school heads are more plenary than that of the parents. According to Justice Reyes in his concurring opinion, while in the case of parents and guardians, their authority and supervision over the children in wards and by law upon the latter reaching majority age, the authority and custodial supervision over pupils exists regardless of the age of the latter. A student over 21 by enrolling and attending a school places himself under the custodial supervision and disciplinary authority of the school authorities, which is the basis of the latter's correlative responsibility for his torts, committed while under such authority. Of course, the teacher's control is not as plenary as when the student is a minor, but that circumstance can only affect the degree of the responsibility but cannot negate the existence thereof. It is only a factor to be appreciated in determining whether or not the defendant has exercised due diligence in endeavoring to prevent the injury, as prescribed in the last paragraph of Article 2180. Special errand and roving commission rule is explained in the case of Castilex Industrial Corporation versus Vicente Vasquez. It reads, where the employer's duties require him to circulate in a general area with no fixed place or hours of work or to go to and from his home to various outside places of work and his employer furnishes him with a vehicle to use in his work, the courts have frequently applied what has been called the special errand or roving commission rule, under which it can be found that the employee continues in the service of his employer until he actually reaches home. However, even if the employee be deemed to be acting within the scope of his employment in going to or from work in his employer's vehicle, the employer is not liable for his negligence where at the time of the accident the employee has left a direct route to his work or back home and is pursuing a personal errand of his own.
Under Article 2180, employers shall be liable for the damages caused by their employees and household helpers acting within the scope of their assigned tasks, even though the former are not engaged in any business or industry. Although the employer is not the actual tort feeser, the law makes him vicariously liable on the basis of the civil law principle of pater familias for failure to exercise due care and vigilance over the acts of one subordinates to prevent damage to another. In the last paragraph of Article 2180 of the Civil Code, the employer may invoke the defense that he observed all the diligence of a good father of a family to prevent damage. In the case of Fiscal Transport Services versus Jose Espinas, to identify the person primarily and directly responsible for the damages would also prevent a situation where a registered owner of a motor vehicle can easily escape liability by passing on the blame to another, who may have no means to answer for the damages caused, thereby defeating the claims of victims of road accidents. The setup may be inconvenient for the registered owner of the motor vehicle, but the inconvenience cannot outweigh the more important public policy being advanced by law in this case, which is the protection of innocent persons who may be victims of reckless drivers and responsible motor vehicle owners. This does not mean, however, that Phil Carr is left without any recourse against the actual employer of the driver and the driver himself. Under the civil law, on principle of unjust enrichment, the registered owner of the motor vehicle has a right to be indemnified by the actual employer of the driver of the amount that he may be required to pay as damages for the injury cost to another. What is the test to determine the existence of negligence in a particular case? The test to determine the existence of negligence in a particular case is by asking the question, did the defendant in doing the alleged negligent act use that degree of diligence that a prudent person would have used in the same situation? If not, then he is guilty of negligence. 2. Is the concept of degree of care to be exercised an absolute term? The answer is no. The concept of degree of care to be exercised is not an absolute term because the standard level of conduct expected in the performance of an obligation would always depend on the nature of the obligation, the circumstances of the person, time and place in light of human experiences and in view of the facts involved in a particular case. Does an adult at all times entitled to recover damages? No. An adult is not entitled to recover damages when the damages sustained was not brought about by a violation of a legal duty and right. Hence, in order to recover damages, he must establish that there must first be a breach of duty and the breach of duty as the proximate cause of his injuries. How about a child? Under the law, a child under 9 years of age must be conclusively presumed incapable of contributory negligence. That is so because discernment or incapacity for negligence is a condition before liability would attach. What are the factors that the law considers in determining the liability of a defendant sued for his negligence in a given situation as asked in Pickard v. Smith? In Pickard v. Smith, it was held that the proper criterion in determining the existence of negligence in a given case is that the defendant has reasonably foresought harm, yet he ignored to guard against any possible harmful consequences. The independent civil actions are those provided in Articles 32, 33, 34, and 2176 of the Civil Code, and they may proceed independently of the criminal action and shall require only a preponderance of evidence. And this is the principle of independent civil actions. It can proceed independently from the criminal action. Nonetheless, the offended party may not have double recovery 